Hello, everyone. Monday, December 12th. Um, I'm really, really happy. We've got uh, Barry Riddles here. Barry really requires little introduction, but I'm happy on so many reasons. A, because I've only met Barry once or twice and I'm a huge fan. And B, um, a lot of you know that I'm accused of being a perma bear and there are too many bears in this room. So if we weren't a, a well adjusted, I don't know if I'll call him a normie, that's kind of an insult, but a well adjusted guy <laughs> who, 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 who could articulate the bullish narrative, okay, who's not one of these. And, 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 and Barry, don't worry, who's not, I'll, I'll, I'll refrain from names, who's not one of these charlatans who we always pound on in this room, okay? Um, Barry's a solid citizen. Um, he's not a perma bull. He's not a perma bear. He calls him like he sees him. And so I'm really glad he's here. Before we do that, though, we have to get into our, um, we have our obligatory um, uh, dates in history. And in particular, um, the three dates I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to seize upon. Uh, in 1915, Frank Sinatra was actually uh, born on this date. In 1893, Edward G. Robinson was born on this date. And then most importantly, in the year 2000, this was the day that the Supreme Court gave the 2000 election the hanging chads to, um, uh, to, to George W. As, as over Al Gore. So in any event, we'll dispense with any further introduction. Let's just get, let's just get right into it. So, uh, hey, Barry, I, I don't know if your keyboard is clicking or whatever. But we, we can hear you, though. So um, anyway, so, Barry, I'm really glad you decided to, uh, to, 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 to come into this space. This is great. You're a prolific uh, writer. Uh, we see you all the time on Bloomberg Television as well. So I think your views are widely uh, well known. Uh, we've got a great audience here, Smart Cookie. So watch out. Um, this is not a there's not a bunch of uh, pushovers here. So Barry, um, we're you know we're in a very uh, historic times in markets. Um, a lot of pushes and push you know, puts and takes here. And you know in this room we've been kind of bearish all year long. More recently, though, that hasn't been working out. Um, and so I'm really glad we're going to have a more balanced discussion here with uh, yours truly. So, Barry, welcome. Um, I don't know if you want to have a go at it for a couple of minutes, and we'll just get right into a uh, into a conversation. So, Barry, what's on top of mind for you in terms of the current market environment and your outlook? And what's kind of like, you know, non-Captain Obvious for you, maybe a differentiated point of view that uh, we wouldn't get on CNBC? So, Barry, take it away. The floor is yours. Sure. Thanks for having me. And, and my apologies for um, the snafu. Uh, who, who knew you just have to occasionally reboot your phone? Um, never apologize for being bearish, especially if you've been on the right side of the market for most of the year. The fact that you guys are bearish is nothing to be, uh, you know, embarrassed about. That that was uh, that was the, the, the right place to be. Um the, the variant perception that you're probably not hearing on television or reading about is really just stepping back and taking a 30,000-foot view. And we, we all get so caught up in the day-to-day, -day, the minute-to-minute, -minute, we lose the ability to understand where we are in the grand cycle. Everybody takes photos, but they forget that a, a cycle, a video, is a series of, of snapshots. And so... The way um, uh, I phrased this towards the end of last year and, the, and, and what I've been saying all of this year is um, we had an unusual run following the financial crisis from 2010 to 2020. Markets gained about 16 percent, almost double, a little over double what, what they typically average. 2020 itself was a plus 18 percent, but that doesn't really give you the full picture from the pandemic lows, it was, I think, plus 68 percent. And then 21 was plus 28 percent. All these numbers are on the S&P 500 um, total returns. And so at a certain point, you have to say to yourself, hey, how long can this run go? A little bit of a mean reversion or even just going sideways would would be enough to let a little bit of the excesses worked off. And so. Last year, we did not make any change in our equity portfolios. In our year-end uh, discussion with clients, we said, don't expect the sort of gains that we've seen over the past few years to continue. Hey, I'll take them if they give it to us. But, you know, we, we are expecting at some point some form of, of a pullback. The only change we made in our, our clients' portfolios, and, and we manage over $3 billion in uh, client assets, 
um, was we shortened up our duration. We did that twice this year, and, and it turned out to be very fortuitous. So, so that's the, uh, the alternative take you're probably not hearing, the big picture view of, hey, uh, you know, markets don't just rip in one direction continuously. The, the only other thing I would add is, you know, anytime you get a, a major reset, I, I think you have to wonder what it means for the cycle. Is this a, a continuation of the secular bull cycle? I, I look at this year as a cyclical bear market within the longer term secular markets. I've been writing about that and talking about that for a long time. And in fact, April 1st, 2020, um, I said, don't assume the secular bull market is over when you have an externality like a pandemic and the government ordering the economy to shut down. Hey, that'll make markets wobble, but things will eventually start to uh, resurrect the prior trend. And, and we've more or less seen that happen. The big change, obviously, this year is inflation and the Fed. But um, that's a whole nother story. So, Barry, this, 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 there's a lot to, lot to run with there. So let's just start from the standpoint of, um, again, again, zoom out, as our, as our uh, crypto maxi friends would say. You know, the Fed, we had the pandemic. The authorities pumped, you know, what was it, four or five trillion of uh, stimulus into the system. They expanded the balance sheet by a similar amount. I think all told was nine and a half trillion. So ex post, and it's always obviously after the fact, you know, what did you think was going to happen? All right. I didn't quite foresee it <laughs> to be candid. All right. You know, as someone cynically once said, you know, they create a lot of money, it goes into the market. They'll make up a story afterwards as to why the market went up. Okay. You know, when there's, when there's more money than, when there's more money than fools, you have a bull market. When there's more fools than money, you have a bear market. Okay, fine. <laughs> All right. So the market went up. Okay. But now it's the morning after. And we're trying to normalize in a halting way. I mean, you know, you're getting fiscal contraction relative to where we were before. The Fed's try, you know, allegedly wants to shrink its balance sheet, but it's kind of interesting. It was only, I think, last week or the week before, we're actually on a 12 month basis. The, the Fed balance sheet actually declined on a year on year basis. So when you start, when you start, and so, so let me let me give you the, the, the sort of, I'll go, I'll go easy on you. It's our first date, okay? So you and I are just going to have a friendly push the ball back and forth. Sure. I, I look at earnings and they're way above trend. All right. And I look at valuations and they're not cheap in historical context. So I say to myself, you know, counting on multiple expansion from here, not a good bet. Earnings, they're so far above trend. If they don't come in, then capitalism is broken. So I look at it and I say to myself, and again, it's a market of stocks. You may say to me, OK, George, I don't want I don't like this sector, but I like that sector. That's fine. I'll, I'll accept that. But writ large, I just have a hard time, given where we are right now, making a, a, a positive case for equities in terms of the indices going forward. What would you say to that? So so first, we'll, we'll take in reverse order. Let's start with valuation. Everybody gets hung up on fair value. Fair value is this moment in time that stocks kind of wave to as they careen past either on the way up to become wildly overvalued or conversely on the way down as they're crashing to become really cheap. But, you know, I defy people to find me a period in time where markets reached fair value and then stayed there for, you know, more than a, a, a minute. Um, and, and there's, uh, you know, there's a longer discussion as to why that is, and it's actually part of my definition of what a bull or a bear market is. But since, since you brought up um, multiples and you brought up valuation, I guess I'll share it right now. And, and, and I define a bull market as a period, a long period in time um, described by expanding um, overall trends in, in the economy, in the GDP, in the labor force. But the underlying psychology is such that investors are willing to pay more and more for that dollar of earnings. And, and that's how you get multiple expansion. Think about the 1982 to 2000 bull market, right? Uh, it, it was huge. And everybody assumes, wow, there must have been some amazing earnings growth. As it turns out, 75 percent of the gains were, were due to not gains in earnings, but Multiple expansion, meaning psychology is underlying the bull market. Conversely, you see the same thing happening in the opposite side, where, where uh, during a, a bear market, 
hey, you could define that as investors being willing to spend less and less on a dollar of earnings. And so you tend to see multiple compression. Um, I, I think 09 kind of startled people. March 09 startled people because we never got down to that 19, you know, 82, 7x on the S and P 500. So, we, so, yeah, so, so, so in other words, if I interrupt, I'm going to make a joke. So, so, so the phone never rang in Jeremy Grantham's study. That was time to get back in. Is that what you're saying? Right. That's exactly right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You know, you, 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 um, and and sometimes they do ring a bell at the bottom. I, I, you know, if you were paying attention. That wasn't too difficult to see. You could have been a couple of months early or late, but it was it was pretty pretty uh, obvious if you were looking in the right places. But hold that aside. So so here we are. Earnings are, are holding up pretty well. Um, the economy, despite the Fed, um, really uh, unprecedented increase in, in rates from such a short period of time and from zero. You know, you continue to see the labor force is doing well. The economy is doing pretty well. There are parts of it that are slowing down. Clearly, commodities are, are, are suffering and the housing market is, is getting um, slapped around a little bit. But overall, you take and you mentioned uh, the CARES Act. So we had three CARES Act. The first one was the largest fiscal stimulus ever uh, at $2 trillion. That was 10 percent of GDP. Massive. Followed by the second one, $1.8 trillion. Both of those under the previous president. Then the third CARES Act was another uh, trillion under the current president. Add to it the infrastructure bill, which is a 10 year um, budget and then another trillion dollars there. And then on top of that, I'm like, I'm not a total government watcher and thinks everything is fiscal. But God damn, if you're going to throw six, seven, eight trillion dollars into the economy, it's hard not to think that all of that money eventually finds its way to, to corporate revenue and earnings, because where else is it going to go? And, and so I think that's a key driver of a, a lot of what's underlying, even when we see earnings being maintained at a, what some people have called artificially high levels. Um, there's some really interesting data out there about, uh, on average, when earnings um, bottom during a, a bull cycle or a bear cycle, as well as when do markets bottom relative to the occurrence of a, of a recession. By the way, I can't, I don't know if we're going to have a recession next year or not, a, a soft landing, a hard landing, no recession at all. Um, but, but this has to be the most telegraphed recession. Yeah. 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 yeah, history, yeah, 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 yeah Barry, I was, let me interrupt. I mean, uh, it's still Jewish line. Don't interrupt me while I'm interrupting you. <laughs> um, so uh, you, you just said you took the words out of my mouth. This is the most telegraphed recession in the history of the world. And whether we get a recession, we don't get a recession. Just to invoke, you know, the, the infamous uh, Bob Farrell line about when everybody's expecting some, one thing, you're going to get something right. else. Either either when to get something else or everyone's expecting it, so it's already discounted. So Right. It's already I mean, in price. Absolutely. So, so so stay with that for a second. Let's just go down. Uh, let's just go down a rabbit hole here. So um, say we don't get a recession. Probably means that dire forecasts of big down earnings, such as I believe in, will not come to be true. But wh how does that speak to about, uh, you know, what you would if, if you knew with perfect foresight that there wasn't going to be a recession? What would you do with that, either in terms of uh, sectors you would buy or would you short the bond market or would you buy the dollar? Like, 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 like if, I, if, I, if God came to you and gave you insider information, says, Barry, I got news for you. No recession. What would that mean to you in terms of how would you invest on, on that basis? Barry? So, so that's a trick question. And I'm going to give you a trick answer. I come to you. God comes to you in December 2019 and says global pandemic. Tens of millions of people are going to get sick. Millions of die, are going to die. The economy is going to close down. We're going to see GDP plummet to insane levels we've never seen. The economy is going to freeze. Uh, you can only make one trade right now, and you have to hold it for six months to a year. What's the trade? And whatever it is, it, it doesn't matter. You're going to be wrong. So yeah, even, even knowing with perfect foresight what's going to happen, you know, give Soros credit for convexity and understanding uh, this is a, sort of a variation of the the three body problem in, in astrophysics, you can't tell what, how all of the subsequent reverberations from the initial uh, event 
is going to affect subsequent actions and how those actions are going to affect subsequent actions. And so uh, this, this is part of the reason why the, we're, we're right in the middle of forecast season. We're getting the year in review that's coming up, a for, preview of 2023. A year is a really war, lo, weird time period because it's not long enough for the big trends to really manifest themselves. But, it's, but it is long enough so that random events can completely derail you, a war in Ukraine, a, a global pandemic, whatever it happens to be. And so whether we have a recession or not shouldn't really impact. The question isn't, are we going to have a recession or not? The question is, how severe a downturn might there be? How, how much of it is going to impact corporate earnings? And how much of that has already been discounted by traders? You know, that's really the three step. Knowing what happens or doesn't happen, that, that's kind of like, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it's the movie, the name of the movie, but it's not the full plot synopsis. And so the problem we, in our office, we call them macro tourists. The problem with thinking you understand what's happening globally, it, it's almost irrelevant. Uh, if I would have told you, hey, you know, giant war, uh, Russia invading Ukraine is going to last almost a year would would you guess oil would be down no, 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 no listen listen what, what you're it's, it's brilliant listen to you speak because what you're basically underscoring is we just don't know we, we and you think you know you're fooling yourself so that, that's a hundred percent okay William so goldman said it best yeah nobody you gotta knows be, anything you gotta be eyes wide open you gotta expect okay so you got so but here's the one thing we do know we know what prices are and we can start to reverse engineer what's discounted in prices. And so you might say to yourself, well, you know, uh, people have sold off, I don't know, X, Y, Z, sick. I'm just making up a story. OK, because everyone's bearish on the uh, everyone's bearish. People have sold sickles to zero, which actually is not the case. But whatever. You might look at prices and say that people have voted with their feet. So this is this is how the pieces are set up on the chessboard. All right. So when you look at the pieces are set up on the chessboard and what's discounted in markets, and what might actually happen? Eyes wide open. Like, where do you see the opportunities, or what direct in what directions do you want to tilt? So, uh, I, I kind of map everything out in terms of probabilities. What's the higher probability? What's the lower probability? And then, if you're going to take the long shot bet, here's how what you should do. But if you're going to take the fat middle, it, it's a different approach. So. Since everybody these days seems to be so hyper focused on the Fed, which I, I, I try not to be, um, I, I think if you, people are focused on will there or won't there be a recession, the, the answer to that question is will the Fed make a little mistake? Will the Fed get it just perfect or will the Fed make a giant mistake? And I think the little mistake, the Fed will over tighten and they'll keep rates too high for too long. That's probably the highest probability outcome. And, and I think this market could withstand that. And if the market hangs in, I think small cap value, things like that will do pretty well. Um, if the Fed makes, um, gets it perfect, well, then we're off to the races and it's big cap t tech resurrects itself. Um, although I'm, I'm not so keen on how Facebook and Tesla has been behaving. Um, uh, you could look at, you know, uh, I'm always tempted to recommend emerging markets and they always seem to disappoint. So I'll, I'll steer, steer clear of that. But but if the Fed, you know, sticks the landing and we avoid a recession and inflation is defeated and we're off to the races, there's still lots of wind at our back and we could continue going. The, the hard one, and, and this is right into your camp is what happens if the Fed wildly over tightens and keeps it there too long and they just uh, cause a recession that's much more uh, severe, deeper and longer lasting than, than expected? Well, well, in that case, you don't want to own any equities and uh, or at least, uh, you know, uh, nothing other than than staples and, and utilities, because, you know, everything is going to get thrown out if that's the case. And we certainly could see another leg down of 15, 20, 25 percent is not unthinkable. It's not a financial crisis down 57 percent. And a lot of this is determined by how badly hit revenues and profits get. But tell me tell me how bad they screw up and I'll tell you how much further down we would go. 
That's great. So let, let me put it another way. You know, there's a couple of ways to invest. You want to beat the market. And, and we're going to get to the, to, to, to the title of the room in a second, the simple but hard, because we need to talk about that. But this is a hard business. You know it and I know it, all right? And there's many ways to play this game. One is, the traditional one is the hunter-gatherer model where everyone goes to find a company which is, you know, not properly understood by the market or good things are not discounted or I know something you don't know because I spoke to the management, but that's hard to do now with Reg FD and everything else. That was okay. Past, you know, okay, so another way to win, though, is a sort of losers, you know, Charlie Ellis, losers game. Um, figure, you know, figure out what's not going to work, what you don't want to own, and avoid that and just stay out of trouble and you don't have to be hitting, you know, winners on every shot. But if you just avoid the losers, you'll, you'll win that way. It's kind of like, you remember the great tennis player, Michael Chang? Um, he would never commit an unforced error. You would always have to beat yourself, all right? It was very frustrating to watch people play against him. So if I said to you, Barry, you know, you have obviously a more sanguine view of the world. But what is it, you know, that, that you would want to avoid, given, given your worldview? Uh I'm not a big fan of nuclear war, so so I hope we can steer clear of that. Um, well, for for instance, for instance, okay, um, let's let's start with some of the long duration. I'm not going to name names. I'm going to be polite here. Um, some of the long duration uh, loss making companies, the unicorns that had no business coming public, that people just threw money at them hand over fist. Those things, I, I personally don't want, I want to be as far away from that as possible. Do you share my antipathy towards those types of stocks? Or are you actually more, uh, more, 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 more forthcoming, you know, more, more sanguine about those types of names? So, so one of my favorite phrases during the financial crisis was, there's no such thing as toxic assets. There's only toxic prices. When, when, when you had a basket of secure, securitized mortgages, um, and, and, oh, that crap is toxic. We don't want to own any of it. And, and if you pay attention to people like Howard Marks of Oak Tree Capital, it, it, there's a price where it's attractive. So down 30 percent, I probably don't want to touch that. Down 80 percent, hell yeah, I'm a buyer. So for the Ubers and the WeWorks of the world, and um, uh, I don't, I'm trying to remember some of the other crap, we, we don't pay attention to any of it because we don't own that stuff. But uh, all the various, um, unless it's in an index, but um, all the various unicorns that came public and some of the other profitless business model ideas, uh, I'm not a fan of, of, of Peloton, but let it get cheap enough and it could probably return generate above market returns. And, and so the, the key is it, it, it's not how bad the company is. It's it's how much room is there for error um, to the upside? How much room do you have? So one of my favorite, you know, bad trade war stories was back when the first iPod, not iPhone, iPod came out. And I'm doing this from memory, but, but Apple was something like $15 a share with $13 cash. And, and anybody we showed that to, uh, oh, it's a piece of crap. It's going out of business. So, so first, footnote, anytime the consensus is this is garbage, pay attention. Because if everybody thinks it's garbage, clearly it's in the price. But secondly, hey, 15 with 13 cash, I have a $2 buffer. I'm okay with that. So when, when we talk about the Ubers, the WeWorks, the, you know, the unicorns that today are profitless but have something interesting going on, it's always a question of at, at a cheap enough price, there's something there. What what Buffett calls the cigar stubs. You know, as long if it gets cheap enough, the the problem is everybody gets interested long before these things get cheap. That's that I really like. That reminds me, of Joel Tillinghast. I'm sure you know. Um, sure. He he has a version of, of your line. It's something like, the story might be right, but the price is wrong. It's, it's a similar, sim, sim, similar type type. But, by the way, let let me interrupt the interruption of the interruption. There is something fascinating about this year in that all of the traditional narratives we've seen that got rolled out, they all collapsed. The billionaire genius, the new economy of tech, um, 6040 is dead. Uh, DeFi will replace regulation. Just just now, here comes the red wave in the election. Just just even if you're if you're a New Yorker. Hey, how about those Mets? They looked like they were going someplace right up until September. So every narrative that the media was pushing 
just utterly collapsed. And, so, and so the story, you know, this most of the stories are bullshit. It, you, we just don't realize it until after the fact. Barry, you, you stepped in it, so I'm going to go. I'm going to go there. So you actually happen to appear on on the network that I have time for. Uh, we're not, gonna, but the, the network shall, that shall not be named. With uh, there's some show on every night. I don't know, Angry Money or something. I don't know, whatever it is. Okay, so all the crap, all, 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 how's your Yiddish spray? All the fakak, the crap that they have. Right. right. Okay. So, like you know, like I don't watch that channel anymore. Right. But if you could speak in general terms, without naming names, or on the Federal Witness Protection Program, in general terms, what you've witnessed. You're in the media. You're a ce- you're, you're 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 a celebrity. I don't want to butter you up too much, but you're 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 you're, you're a name, okay? And you know, like you take right now, what's going on with crypto and and, and 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 you know FTX and and get the name right, Barry. Just just for the record, it's not Sam Bankman Fried. It's scam, bank run, fraud. We got to be clear about that, okay? So, but you look at the way the guy is deified, and the sort of fawning. That, that the media did over this guy. I don't know if you, I'll send it to you later, but there was a classic one that uh, on CNBC, someone strung together uh, this montage. The super clip. Yeah, the super clips. Okay, right. So Barry, like, like, what is it with all these people? Are they just, it's just there are no real investigative financial reporters anymore or they're all on the take? Like, how does this stuff happen? Or is it an implicit pressure to just sort of talk the talk? Like, what is going on, Barry? <sighs> so that's a long, complicated question. The, the short answer is never assume malevolence when simple stupidity will suffice. Um, so so a lot of this is just, you know, uh, I, I have this I have this debate with people all the time. Keep, keep in mind, and, and, and this is true for everybody and every transaction. You have to always ask yourself, hey, what's this other person's agenda What's in it for them? Uh, uh, is it a fair exchange of, of, of value between us? So, uh, and, I, and I always argue with my right-wing buddies about the liberal media bias, and my response is always, I don't know, what you see as liberal bias, I see as lazy, sensationalistic, focus on nonsense. It's not left or right. It's just what's going to generate clicks. How, how low can can we go to generate stuff? I, I I have I flick around the channels. I'm primarily watching Bloomberg in the morning, and the TV's muted most of the day. But I, I can't watch any channel for more than 15 minutes and not hear you know a handful of things that are not just wrong but reflect a fundamental model of the universe that is deeply flawed. And you know, without getting too esoteric. Uh, what I'll give you one of my favorite examples from the Gulf War. So I'm old as dirt. 2003, the Gulf War starts. And I don't know if you remember, but the Allies accidentally bomb a mosque and oil prices spike. And the Wall Street Journal headline was um, uh, oil spikes as Allies accidentally bomb mosque. And by the end of the day, not only did the price of oil come down, it, it went red on the day and turned negative. So that, that headline is still on .com on the website, only it was changed to oil collapse despite Mosque being accidentally bombed. And it's just a reminder that, hey, we're full of hindsight bias. We're always coming up with these narratives, these stories, and, and they're primarily nonsense. So, you know, I, I wrote this up um, – the other day, 24-7 financial advice, um, I was offered a, a daily TV show and, and I uh, elected to pass. And they said, why? And, I, and my answer was, if, if I had a nightly television show, I would come out and say, own a inexpensive basket of, of global low cost ETFs, rebalance once a year. See you tomorrow. And there's now 59 minutes <laughs> and 41 <laughs> seconds of dead air that follows. So you can't, you know, uh, you, you know, you you're watching good investing is is boring. And and you have to if you're an investor, not a, I started on a trading desk. The older I get, the longer my holding period has become. Barry, Barry what, you, what you just said, I just want to warn you right now. Not only is this being recorded, we're going to put out a couple of clips. You just had the line of this space. And I quote, good investing is boring. Oh my of God! Course. 
don't don't tell that to the Robin Hood guys or, or, or the Ark disciples. Okay, so now let's go to the title of the room. Simple but hard. You and I were pushing the ball back and forth this morning around this around this room title. Right. The gamification of the system. Um, you know, following narratives. You know, I had someone tell me three years ago, I was having a hard time with the Corey Driven Mark, and they said to me, it's real simple. They said, George, it's real simple. Just pay attention to the story. Don't pay attention to valuation. Don't read Zero Hedge and forget about macro. All right? And that's all you had to know. All right? But as Warren Buffett says, what the, what the wise man does in the beginning, the fool ends up, ends up doing in the end. So that got carried, carried to, an, to an excess. But I'm really just worried or concerned that the public, so many of them, you know, have, 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 have come of age investing in the in the GFC era. They kind of think that this what we've seen in the last 13 years is kind of normal. And we're going to get to your 2009 call later. But what we've seen in the last 13 years is not normal. And so could you just talk a little bit about, you know, your views about how the public is abusing money, why it's simple but hard, and and, 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 and what do you think we should be doing differently? And also in this, the role that the, the financial intermediaries are playing. I mean, listen, you know, Robin Hood's happy to do this all day long. You know, Ken Griffin front running orders with payment for order flow and so on and so forth. I mean, it's just outrageous. So it's T-ball time, Barry, go for it. You, if I triggered you, you can respond to whatever part of that you want. Uh, that, that's a lot of different triggers in there. For, first, you, you and I talked about the captain of the, the, the Titanic complaining how, how, how wrong the iceberg is. And it's like it's not your, you know, it's your job as the captain to navigate around the iceberg, not not to plow into it, regardless of whether the iceberg is is right or wrong. So the structure of of the stock market is such that payment for order flow exists. It's legal. It exists. It's replaced the older format. Um, and, and to be blunt, the this is a golden era for investors. Buying the entire market costs you nothing. There's no cost for trades. You could get either the Vanguard total market or the S&P 500 for three bips. The spreads are, are you can barely fit a razor blade between them. I, I, I personally, I don't really give a crap if if the the high frequency traders are doing that. The the way to beat someone at their game is to not play their game. So hey, maybe you shouldn't be a day trader trying to jump in and out against millennials, um, millenniums, uh, super fast computers and their sniffers and packet algos and all that fun stuff. Maybe that's a bad strategy. You know, you you mentioned Charlie Ellis before who, who was talking about unforced errors. One of the other things he said is, you know, you look at the trading that's done today, the vast majority of it, um, oh, let me back up. You look at a football game today. These are the biggest, fastest, strongest sons of bitches there are that you would never think of. I'm going to suit up and jump on on the field to play with these guys. They would they would need three different you know gurneys to wheel you off the the field with. But nobody thinks twice about doing that in the markets and saying, "Hey, I'm going to go up against the biggest, baddest, smartest, most prepared, deepest capitalized companies." Because I think I could scratch out a couple of bucks against them. It, it, it's very, very similar to that sort of, um, I'm an amateur, I'm going to suit up and go up against the pros. And so, you know, they have certain requirements that you probably shouldn't walk into their poker game and sit down at the table. That That's probably a mistake. So avoiding where you know there are sharks, avoiding where you know you have a huge disadvantage is an advantage. Uh, again, you, you referenced avoid making unforced errors. Why do you want to go up against these people who are, you know, so good at what they do? I would rather not play that game. So, so that's, uh, that, that's, that's the whole, uh, you know, payment for order flow discussion. P.S. I set up a Robin Hood account last year um, to just see what the hell is going on with it. I played with it for a while and then, I want to say May or June this summer. I, I, I killed it. It was it's just a terrible interface. I don't I don't see the appeal. Although I guess if if you're a millennial at home with with you know stimmy money, maybe maybe that was was fun. P.S. Go back and look through the investor TikTok um, rabbit hole for just the most hilarious, terrible advice said so sincerely 
it's great. And, and I ended up finding this awesome um, picture of a tattoo that someone had, had written, uh, no regrets. Uh, it was supposed to be no <laughs> regrets. And, and, you know, I remember starting out on a trading desk and I used to ask the head trader, I, I understand why are these people, you know, this is obviously a bad trade. This is obviously a mistake. Why are people doing this? This just seems so dumb. And I'll never forget his answer it was always, Hey, someone's got to be on the wrong side of the trade. <laughs> and, and so, you know, I, I've, I've over the past, 20 years to, to almost 30 years evolved from a trader into an investor, mo mostly in the past, I don't know, let's call it 15 years really became a more serious investor than trader. And you, you, you start to learn, uh, all right, you want to complain about the fed complain about the fed. Oh, payment for order flow. You know, I, I keep saying this over and over again. My job isn't to sit at cafe Reggio sipping espresso scratching my goatee and thinking deep thoughts. My, my job is to try and keep our clients invested on the right side of, of the obvious trades, keep them invested for the long haul and not get distracted by all of the nonsense that, uh, that everybody gets sucked into. And that's part of the simple, but hard uh, answer. You know, my buddy, David Nodig has this great line he uses all the time. That, that I've been stealing pretty regularly, which is investing is a problem that's been solved. We, we already know, uh, you know what? But Warren Buffett tells people, buy an index fund, put it away till you retire. Don't look at it. You're good, right? Uh, that sounds like great investment advice. Really, really hard to do. The day-to-day -day noise machine makes it really challenging. 100%. 100%. On track. All right, so Barry, time out for a second here. So, um We've got some smart cookies already up on the stage, and if By you, way, I assume question... your audience hates this line of bullshit from me. No, right? no, no, no. You know what? You know what? Um, you are. I mean, my detractors are. They, they, if you think I'm a perma bear, I, I, I regularly get requests for bulls in the room. Um, you're an intelligent fellow. You're making the case, whether it's right or wrong. Details will fall on eleven o'clock news. Who the hell knows? But. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll make your hair catch on fire. This can be a fair and balanced. <laughs> this can be a fair and balanced discussion. Is one, one right wing television network would always say. So there we go. So anyway, that, with that, I want to open it up. To, if you have a question for Barry, please uh, raise your hand. Let's go to Gnostic first. Gnostic, the floor is yours. Barry, a like minded soul. Oh my God, George, good, good, bring in. Um, as I'm sure Barry's aware that, well, maybe he's not aware of the people in the room, but for the people in the room here, virtually all of us have been mauled by traders and mauled by all of the stuff you're talking about and learned the hard way. I mean, we've all lost money. Uh, and we've all been very brilliant at losing the money uh, and rather confused <laughs> afterwards going, I was so brilliant. How did I lose that money? And our ego's not letting us sit down and, and ram into the brick wall a few times before we finally realized that that broken nose was basically because the wall was stronger than we were and what kind of idiots were we in the first place? <laughs> and we eventually develop a degree of humility that says, oh, I can be very wrong and still think I'm right. Um, but when sitting down and looking at all the people that are coming in and starting to trade, one of the problems I had years ago, um, when, one of the gentlemen that, that was fairly significant in my market uh, I'm having dinner with him, and I'm all confused and trying to express this. And he looked at me like I was the dumbest human being on the face of the earth. And what he said, I never forgot. It's my ball, my bat, my glove, my diamond. Oh, by the way, and I make the rules. You think you can win? Good luck. <laughs> and it didn't matter what the complaint was. One of them always fit one of those. Ball, bat, glove, diamond, rules, take your pick. Um and I said, well, what the hell can I do? And he said, just stop, stop playing the game. Right. You know, realize that the only way you can win is not to play, become an observer, and bet on who you think is going to win the game. Um, you, you know, there's a great Howard Marks quote that references that, you know, when you, you ran into the wall, broke your nose. And, and I love this line. It's, it, it, uh, experience is what we get when we don't get what we want. Yes. <laughs> I, I love it. Barry, could you do me a favor, please, and DM me, because I would like to talk to you offline uh, about sure. asset management, which is in your thing. 
because you're one of the few that actually make a balance of sit down and say, hey, just buy the ETFs and then sit down on the side. It's not my want to do because I do like trading and I do get excited and my adrenaline fix does come in from profiting from it. But I don't always win often enough to think that I'm the hero on earth. But one of the other things I was going to say is that the introduction of Robin Hood and some of the other ones brought in a whole new generation of traders, whether it was trading in Bitcoin or trading in anything else, they're getting an experience of sitting down, being relatively independent. Yes, they're getting their <clears throat> ball <clears throat> things handed to them uh, on a platter in many, many circumstances in many areas, but they're quite persistent about it. And much as I argue with, with Bitcoiners and Bitcoin maxis about the validity of their stuff, they're still learning. They're learning to trade. They're learning to invest. They're learning what investment is all about. And this has been missing because the way the system it used to be you'd go into the business, become a trader, floor trader, do whatever, an investment house, learn to do it, do it in school, get your MBA, do all the rest of the stuff. But all of that has gone by the way for at least a generation, maybe a generation and a half. But now we're getting people coming back in. Um, and, and that's bringing going to bring lifeblood into the markets in a way that we haven't seen in many, many, many years. So I think it's a good thing. Uh, everything you say, I, I agree with. I could argue with half a dozen of it, uh, but it would be like arguing with myself anyway. And as my wife used to say, you know both sides of the argument. Go to the corner when you're finished arguing. Come back and have dinner. You, you know, every cycle we seem to go through this new uh, regime change and uh, the next generation comes in, the new, the new crew comes in. And, and you know they got to get smacked on the wrists or or worse by the market. It, it's how you learn. You know I have a vivid recollection of watching guys literally something opens up, you know down fifteen percent that they held overnight, and watching people lean over and and puke up breakfast into the the waste paper basket. You kind of have to go through that, and uh, you, humans are unique for not only having the ability to learn from history and, and other people's experiences, but, but a seemingly stubbornness in refusing to do so. It, it's, and, and that's, I guess I'm stealing that from Galbraith, but uh, uh, essentially every cycle, they're all, they're all completely different. They're all based on different things. And yet the parallels are, are just so often there. Um, it does just because things got frothy at the end of last year doesn't mean it, it's the dot com implosion and is going to drop 80 percent. Although you certainly can find sectors of the market where that happened. Look, look at SPACs, look at uh, crypto, look at a whole bunch of stuff that new technology, new new investment vehicles found found their way towards that. So. Um, I'm trying to remember, was it The Money Game by Adam Smith? In, in that book, there's a fund manager who, bought, who hires a bunch of young guns to run his funds. The great, and, um, that's the great Winfield, yes, yes. Uh, that's right. And, yeah. and the reason he does that is like, I can't buy any of the shit that these guys are buying, but I'll ride it up with them and I'll know when to cut it loose and I'll know when to fire them. And so essentially, every generation has to learn what the previous generation learned as well as the previous generation has to say, maybe I need to pay attention to this because the young guys seem to understand this better than me. Uh, I, I was one of those that got fired when I ran into the brick wall, um, which was totally hard. The thing that continually surprises me with the Bitcoin argument and the new people coming out, when you try to explain to them that whatever you're investing, Hey, Gnostic, you're in the matrix. We're losing you. <laughs> All right. Gnostic, hold it. We'll, we'll come back when you get to a better place. All right. Uh, I don't know if Amy, Baron, Mike, Michael, uh, please unmute yourself. You have a question for Barry? Yes. Um, big admirer. Follow Barry. I uh, love you, George. You know that. Um, but I can't help but thinking that, you know, that now that we have a new interest rate regime, and if you go back to 1980, and you take a look at the S&P at 118 and I don't know, the Dow at 1,000 plus or minus something. What if this movie's happening in, happening in reverse? And what if um, over time, as interest rates rise, equities sell off? Is, is, could that happen? Of course it could happen. In fact, 
it, it, it certainly has happened this year. So anyone who told you it couldn't happen missed 2022. The question is, you know, uh, his, uh, this is always misattributed to Twain. There's no evidence he said it, but history doesn't repeat, but it certainly rhymes. Uh, when, whenever there's a comparison between two different eras, you have to look at both the similarities and the differences. Right. And so I think what the question, I think, Michael, I think what you're talking about, you're like, I mean, I mean Barry, what, what, you know, the, the sort of great moderation we had with, um, you know, while you know, big expansion in profit margins accompanied by um, a big multiple expansion. I think, Michael, what you're talking about is possibly that movie running in reverse. Is that what you have in mind? Correct. Michael? Exactly, George. Well, well, that's what I mean by a bear market is a, an increasing de willing, uh, unwillingness of investors to pay less and less for the same dollar of earnings. So depending on how bad things get, if rates go, you know, anywhere near 6 percent, if GDP starts to falter, if revenue slows down, if corporate earnings really begin to take it on the chin, uh, I don't I don't see why we wouldn't see 15, 20, 25 percent downside in equities. The the challenge is what are the odds of that happening? How much of that is is already priced in? How, how bad can it get? How much do we have we already discounted? And and you know how big a mistake does the Fed make? Do they do they stick the landing? Do they make a little mistake? Do they make a giant mistake? Uh, it, it, it's so difficult to to take a guess at, at that. But but all that said, it, it's absolutely viable. Keep keep in mind. Jerome Powell is not your traditional economist Fed chair. He's not a Bernanke. He's not a Yellen. Um, and so he, he brings a somewhat different approach. My, uh, my criticism of the Fed is they were way late to get off zero. The emergency has ended, but they stayed on emergency footing. In 2021, inflation went up through their 2% target. They did nothing by the uh, and And by the way, I'm in team transitory. I really think that this will eventually all go back to normal as we reopen, as semiconductors come online. You notice nobody's talking about the backup at the ports in Long Beach anymore. That's all kind of coming um, back to normal. The, the cost of shipping from China to the West Coast is now back to pre-pandemic level. So I think this but eventually... Oil, but oil is definitely at very low inventory levels, and that's the life blood of everything that's priced you know, in terms of inflation. So one of my favorite charts is to show a 10 year chart of oil. And as much as everybody's upset about the price of gas and inflation, or whatever oil today, I have to look at the chart because it may have changed, but oil a couple of weeks ago was cheaper in, uh, I want to say July or September of 2022 than it was in the same period in 2012. So essentially we've had a decade of flat energy prices. And so now, whenever wouldn't that indicate that possibly in the future, given the inventory levels, the sheer inventory levels of nat gas and oil and these other items that we're in a, in a regime change where the interest rate has to come up and equities have to come down. Uh, I don't, I haven't looked at the data showing um, any of the oil variables and, and subsequent market behavior. Um, it's an interesting idea. Keep in mind, the technology to extract oil from the ground has changed, and <laughs> as has a variety of, of various um, uh, capital investments around fracking and around those sort of those sort of technologies. And so, uh, you know, I don't I don't think as much. Uh, back in back in the day, I used to follow M um, two money supply and flow of funds. Right. And, that made a huge difference, and then all of a sudden, it just stopped mattering. the The nature of the the economy changed, so those data points became kind of a kind of irrelevant. And so, I don't really think about oil supplies because, at least here in the United States, we have a ton of oil, we have a ton of natural gas, and um, you know, whether it's in the in the pipeline or soon to be extracted, the price goes up, people pump more oil. The price comes down, the more expensive fracking slows down. And so it's this homeostatic system that seems to self-regulate 
uh, based on market forces. But they're not incentivized to do it. And with ESG and everything else, there it there's less of all of that. So there's less supply. So right. so separate separate oil companies from ESG. But by, by the way, my my favorite critique um, of uh, the low carbon funds is why do you want to rerun the war on drugs that the United States has lost over the past 50 years? It's pretty clear that if you interdict supply but leave voracious demand in place, you're going to fail, right? If we learned anything about the war on drugs, it's a two-sided economic equation, supply and demand. So saying I'm going to have a low-carbon fund where I don't have all these oil companies but instead, I'm going to fill this fund with oil consumers, with energy consumers. If you're a rational economic uh, analyst, that, that makes no sense whatsoever. Now, that said, if you're ExxonMobil, if you're uh, BP Amico, if you are go down the list of big companies, or if you're any of the wildcatters or small providers, uh, you don't give a, a flying fig about ESG. All you know is that, hey, it costs me X to get oil out of the ground. When it's paying X plus 20, I'm a seller. When it's paying X minus 20, I'm going to sit on my hands. And uh, ESG is irrelevant to, to those people. It's just not, it's just not uh, in, in the real world, hey, I have a, a commodity. I, 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 I don't care what. And, and by the way, we have lots of clients that want to see portfolios reflect their personal values. But it has to be logical. It has to make some sense. Just saying I, I want low carbon while not interdicting the demand just doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. Thanks for the questions, Mike. I'd like to get on to some of the other uh, panelists. Uh, Amy, Baron, Real, uh, any of you have a question for Harry? Baron, the uh, floor is yours. Please unmute yourself. Hi, Barry. How you doing? Pretty good. Good, good to hear you. Um, You've made some comments about uh, how stocks are you know, coming down the prices and everything. And what we've seen this year is really like a dialing in of prices for for the less desirables. And then now we're get, entering a phase of the more desirables, i.e. the mega caps. So we've seen, you know, we've seen the small caps get crushed. We've seen, you know, a, a variety of, uh, you know, stocks get crushed. And now, now we've finally crept up to the mega caps where... Facebook got crushed, you know, on sentiment, sentiment, of course, uh, and then Twitter and Tesla, what's Microsoft got a little bit of a hit, Google got a little bit of a hit, all at ad revenue, of course, ad revenues are coming down, and they still will come down next earning season and beyond. Um, Amazon got slammed and admitted uh, that basically they're going to have horrible earnings and margins going forward. I, honestly, I really do. I have to say that. And then... Um, you know, now we've got Apple. Apple's been flying off the board trying to, you know, put put a lipstick on the pig uh, nonstop. No matter what the problem is, they just pull it out. Well, we're going to have a bad 8% year-over-year loss in margins. However, next quarter we expect to be up. So if you just hold long, you'll be good. $180 price target. So what are your opinions about that and how they've been been kind of dialing his yeah, yeah, yeah. But Baron, you're, you're kind of breaking up us. Is, is the question about Apple, is that your question, Baron? Uh, no. I, I heard the whole question. I, I got it. I'm, I'm actually, okay. as, as we're speaking, I'm, I'm pulling up a bunch of charts. My, my to... question is around the market and how they're playing, you know, basically tweaking the prices down by pumping the others up. Uh, what is your opinion on uh, that? So the indices are pumping up. We've got these individual mega caps coming down significantly. And then, you know, they're just dialing them in. And one by one, they become less desirable. Now, what's left? We've got Apple, maybe a couple, maybe one other. Maybe Microsoft's still doing pretty good. You know, when, do, when does that come to an end? And, you know, uh, you said prices coming down. Uh, so so let, let's look at a few of these because I think you got to be careful. Oh, that's a five year. Let me go year to date. I think you got to be careful not to paint with the same broad brush. Uh, across the board and and in no particular order i just punched into my screen uh apple facebook meta i still can't call it meta uh microsoft tesla let's let's throw goog in there for another uh thing that i i can't call um by the by the proper name 
Um, so Apple, year to date, down just under 19 percent. It's holding up really well. Why is that? Because uh, they've got the, the narrative is they have a fabulous um, closed system where they're they've locked in their their clients. They continue to innovate. The technology continues to to impress. I have the the new iMac and MacBook with the new Apple. I forgot the name of the chip. And it's the first time in years that I've seen an order of magnitude improvement in speed. If you remember back in the late 80s and 90s, every time something new came out, it was like, oh, my God, a giant. And then that went away for about 15 years. This new, I think it was the M1 chip. I don't remember the name of it. it, it it's just it's just a beast. So not a surprise Apple is holding up um, better. By the way, I wrote a piece for the street.com in like 2001. Apple continues to be underestimated by um, Wall Street. It's amazing to say the largest company in the world is still, uh, I guess, a little bit underestimated. Microsoft down 20, just about 25 percent. They have their lock in enterprise customers and, and you know, uh, plus or minus 25 percent doesn't make that big a difference to a company that size. After a 10 year run that's been, you know, once once Balmer left, um, who was really just a terrible CEO. But but once he was replaced, uh, you know, uh, Microsoft has has done really well. Uh, Google has uh, less lock in. And I've been a little Amazon is the other one you mentioned. I've been a, a little um, less than enthralled with them, but uh, as a company. But, you know, they, they still still have a lot of great um, uh, revenue share. Now, now you start to get into the other half on this. I, I, I don't know if you remember, but I, last year, 2021, a year where the market was up 28%, Amazon did nothing. I think it gained 3% or some, some single digit. Um, Amazon is going through this giant change. I, I don't know if you spend a lot of time on Amazon and, and my house and office spends an obscene amount of money on Amazon. But they've, they are no longer special. They were once really an amazing site. It's looking more and more like eBay with they're selling ads, third-party promotions. Um, it's no longer Amazon. It's now third-party sellers. Hey, if I wanted a, a crappy overpriced site festooned with, with, with advertisement, I, I know where eBay is. I could go look at that crap there. So I think Amazon kind of um, – uh, screwed the pooch a little bit with their their um, behavior. Uh, Facebook is its is its own thing. The supermajority voting shares with um, Zuck has always been problematic, but really the bottom line is that Apple took their legs out from under them by saying. By the way, I think Facebook is a really bad actor. Um, I haven't deleted my account, but I've stripped it about five years ago of any identifying information and it's just you know if 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 you're not paying for the product then you are the product um radio television in the old days was like that facebook is like that apple said you know there's upside to us to showing we're protecting our our customers from invasive privacy violating things and so basically apple saw the opportunity to stick a dagger in zuck's back and they did and what a coincidence, uh, the stock has gotten cut, uh, more than cut in half. Uh, Facebook is really, wow, down 66%, down two thirds. That, that, that's some debacle. Um, and really, you could credit or blame Apple for it. By the way, Facebook deserves credit for some of the best um, acquisitions over the past couple of years. You know, when, when you look at things like Instagram or WhatsApp or go down the list of all the various uh, acquisitions they've done. They've really made some amazing acquisitions. Uh, the problem is, like MySpace and other social media outfits behind them, they're no longer cool. Once your parents uh, went on Facebook, the kids left and, and now they're on TikTok. The next gener younger generation, uh, Facebook is no longer hip. And, you know, the Elvis has left the building to show, again, how old I am. Uh, so at a certain price, Facebook will become attractive. I have no idea where that price is. Tesla is this perplexing thing that I have wanted to be short for two years. 
And because clients own it, I really can't be short. But before the whole Twitter thing happened, I just thought Tesla was wildly overpriced. They have the, the better technology. Their software is better. The over-the-air updates are better. It turns out that you know self-driving is not quite what it, it, it was presented to be. But the crazy thing that I can't wrap my head around is, hey, who, who are Tesla buyers? Talk about ESG in the woke audience and, you know, leaning liberal as opposed to conservative. Why would you, as the wealthiest person in the world, where all that at wealth is coming from Tesla? Like if I said to Elon Musk a year ago, hey, let's figure out what could you do to alienate the most amount of potential Tesla buyers? I can't imagine anyone would say, buy Twitter, become a right wing troll and piss off everybody who is a potential Tesla buyer uh, while the rest of the industry is ramping up their EVs. And, you know, good good for Elon Musk that he he forced the rest of the auto industry to, you know, step up and move to embrace EVs. And and I say this as a guy who's got a garage full of mostly internal combustion engine cars. So I, I think that I'm kind of shocked. Like I have um, – I have a Jiminy Cricket. My, my, the vice chair of my investment committee that I chair is Michael Batnick. And I rely on my, Michael Batnick to every now and then pick up the phone and say, hey, schmuck, what are you tweeting? You know we have clients. Delete that. What, what sort of an idiot are you? And everybody needs somebody like that in their life. Elon Musk doesn't have that. And, and if he did, I, I, don't, I think Tesla would be in better shape. He, he seems to be going... Out of his way, I don't know if you saw the tweet about prosecute Fauci. I, I mean, really? I don't care what your views are, left or right. My favorite example of this is, does, do you remember about five years ago, Nike uh, selected Colin Kaepernick to be their spokesperson, and all of the crazies on TV, their head, heads exploded. Right. All of these fat, old, balding white dudes were screaming about wokeism. Um, but actually, if you're Nike, your audience isn't fat, old, screaming white dudes on Fox TV. Your audience is young, urban, athletic, hip, international consumers. And if you look at the Nike chart since Colin Kaepernick became the spokesperson, it was a brilliant marketing move. And very often, our emotional initial response completely misses the, the data and the analysis of who are our customers, who are they going to relate to. You know, Nike, I guess, could have made Tucker Carlson their spokesman, but I don't think that's going to sell oh, any. So, 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 Barry, I have to interrupt here. Um, yeah. We try to stay away from politics here, but. This isn't this, politics. No, it's not, is, it's not. It's not. It's not. Let me finish the sentence. This is not politics. Let's get closer. So I want to ask you a question. So I, I, I have sympathy for what you just said. I'm not saying sure I agree with it, but that's okay. So let me ask you a question. I want to see if there's symmetry in what in your views. Sure. What do you make? What do you make? Of, especially as, as one Jew to another, what do you make of Nike dropping Kyrie Irving? So, you know, I haven't seen the specifics of the the data analysis. My assumption is somebody turned around and said. Here's how many shoes he sold. Here's here's the risk of alienating this group of people. Do we really want to be associated with with this person? Um, the same with Adidas and Kanye. They said, and and that's even a more difficult decision to make because Kanye has moved some sneakers. I mean, uh, the Yeezy line is billion plus dollars worth of Adidas. He just became so toxic that there was no surviving that. So. So when, uh, you know, there's two aspects to this. One is just, hey, is this big enough that we can ride it out? Is this, is this something that we could just get past? Or this guy is radioactive and, and it'll just cost us too much to be part of it. So, by the way, I, I don't own a Tesla, um, but I'm in the midst of converting an 80s era 911 to an EV, essentially use, dropping a Tesla motor and controller and battery pack into it um and i i'm gonna have an electric 911 before porsche makes an electric 911 so but so Barry, I'm, Barry, that's terrific so, so this this is perfect segue for our next uh for your next questioner uh howard who's a dear friend 
aside from being sharp, a thing or two about automobiles. So, Howard, I don't know what unit, what 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 hemisphere you're in right now, but uh, the floor is yours. Go for it, Howard. Thank you so much, George. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yep. All good. All right. It, it uh, these three G connections out in the middle of everywhere can be uh, real fickle. Uh, Southern Hemisphere, staying warm in Tonga at the moment as we move around the South Pacific and do some meetings. But uh, uh, this is another fantastic space. So thank you for that. And thank you, Barry, for making the time. And George, for Cocta is literally, literally, I swear to God, the, the number one word we're using around our, our household and, uh, and uh, virtual office at this point. So um, uh, keep it up. Anyway, and uh, one thing about cars while we're on it, um, that Fiat that is uh, my, um, uh, what do they call it, a Twitter avatar, that thing's a 28-liter engine. It's a four-cylinder. We used to make cars with, with cylinders that were as big as a gallon. So I think we've gotten a little better at the efficiency thing <laughs> before even getting to the electrics. But uh, Barry, uh, kudos for, um, for doing an electric 911. We're into these... Uh, uh, retooled electrics projects of, of all types. There's some really great stuff happening. And if, if folks are interested at all, just look up some of the companies that are retooling cars now to be electrics. Everything from the, from the 20s to the 80s is being redone now. So uh, if you think you can't do it, there are folks out there that can, uh, that can do it for you. Um, I, uh, I share some of Gnostic's trading debacles, and I can't match his humor today. But the thing that I can say about that is that uh, coming out of venture capital and startups as my, my first set of disasters, I didn't know we were supposed to learn from those trading debacles. I just kept banging around and, uh, and making mistakes. But e even though I spent uh, quite a bit of time uh, building profit sharing funds and a couple of endowments, you know, modest ones, but nonetheless that required all of the old disciplines and sensibilities that you bring, Barry. So I appreciate you coming on and sharing the old uh, sensibilities and some balance about what's going on these days and how to work with it. Um, and as a result, um, and, and I should add, we've had to do a fair bit of recent cleanup as funds we built forever ago um, found their way into the new world and made disasters of themselves. So that's uh, something we've ended up having to do the last couple of years. But um, two messages I have for, for folks in the room. I missed the early parts of Barry. I'm going to skip the questions. Um, but two messages I want to give folks. One, to all of the hard bears, and I include myself amongst you, um, give Barry real consideration and, and a real listen because he's... Uh, He's talking about much better ways for us to do things um, and build, you know, build real portfolios, invest over the long term. And to the younger folks, if we have any in the room today, uh, if uh, us baby boomers are a little too old for you, um, uh, Barry's partner, Josh Brown, who's a Gen Xer who may still be too old for you, um, brings this same skill set and this same way of thinking and the same portfolio building and if you're you know, looking for someone younger to speak to you, um, give Barry's partner a chance. And I just want to uh, thank you guys for doing this again. Thanks for that, Howard. Much appreciated. Uh, let's go over to uh, Chaos and then Urs. Chaos, please unmute yourself. Uh, thank you, George. And, and thanks for having the um, spaces tonight. Um, Barry, I've, I've enjoyed your writing and uh, a lot of your commentary that I've been able to access on social media. And um, I spent the first half of my career in a brokerage environment and saw a lot of the types of disasters that, that you described. Uh, and the other half I spent in the benchmark hugging world of, of uh, trust management. And I can see lots of warts on, on both uh, sides of that equation. And when we talk about the current <clears throat> environment, and I'm, I'm going back now to the, the conversation we were having earlier about uh, the mega caps and where they stand. Um, and prior to that, when you were talking about the Warren Buffett advice of just buying the index and sticking it in a drawer and forgetting about it, um, 
one of the things that has been on my mind is the concentration at the at the top of the index, which to me looks like a small collection of overpriced fat albatross hanging around the neck of anybody that wants to own the index for the next 10 years. And I say that as somebody that sat in front of people in the first quarter of 2010 and explained to them that the part of their account that we're measuring using the S&P 500 was being compared to a benchmark that had a 0.0% return for the trailing 10 years. Um, and that's total return. That's not including taxes on dividends in a taxable account. And, and I say that because it, it gives me pause. Uh, you know, I can definitely see the wisdom of not wanting to do too much. Um, but I also feel like I see this potential for what people would call a lost decade um, that might be self-inflicted when it looks so similar to what I was looking at in 2000. And so if you were talking to somebody that was at a nonprofit or, or, or somebody that, that was, had a preferred habitat of just doing exactly what Warren Buff, Buffett says, buy the index, stick in a drawer and forget about it, but they also had this other concern, what would you say to that person? So I'm not sure the comparison to 2000 is, is the best one we can make here. Even though we've had a great decade, that great decade followed a lost decade where, you know, from from the 2000 peak to, uh, I want to say 2013 it was March of 2013 was when we first made uh, highs above the previous two market highs on a, on a sustained basis. You know, go back to the end of 2000, the, the biggest stocks were. Uh, not most of them were not profitable. The the hot telecom and internet stocks. Some of these companies didn't even have revenues. When when you look at the top ten in the S and P five hundred, it's the names we've been talking about: Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Alphabet, Berkshire Hathaway's, United Health Group, um, Google, Johnson and Johnson. These are all cash machines. So uh, on the one hand, the top 10 is probably about 25 percent of the S&P 500, not wildly overweighted, but a little little top heavy. Um, not not that that you can really use that as a timing method. Um, so, so I look at the, the profitability, the maturity of the companies. Like I, I remember having conversations with people about Cisco in late 99 because. They had done all this vendor financing, so their customers, all these revenues were fake. It's like, all right, we'll lend you the money to buy this, and we'll just take an accounts receivable. And eventually, people kind of figured out there wasn't a whole lot of there there. That was before some of the other um, networkers and routers and Lucent's and Nortel's and all those um, companies really just imploded. Peak to trough, the NASDAQ was down 81% from, from the high in, in March 2000, uh, having doubled over the previous six months, down to um, the lows. It was either October 02 or March 03. You had that that double bottom. And, and, you know, I look at the top 10 companies. They're mature. They're growing revenues. They're profitable. Some of them are wildly profitable. So it's hard to draw that comparison. Now, that said, ain't nothing suggesting that we can't go into a 10-year market of, you know, I, I mentioned earlier the secular bull and secular bear. Let me step back and just give you two minutes on that because I think it's really helpful. Um, my, my favorite example, World War II ends, 1946, 40 million GIs come home. They all have the GI Bill. They go to college. And what happens over the next, I don't know, let's call it 20 years? You have the rise of suburbia, the, uh, the entire war machinery shifts back to a civilian footage. Um, we, we moved, uh, we, we expand or build out and expand the interstate highway system. Uh, the electronics industry explodes, the rise of civilian aviation. Um, really, television comes into its own. And on and on, you just have these massive economic forces that, yeah, you occasionally had uh, drawdowns in the, in the stock market and occasionally had recessions. But overall, you just had this massive set of forces 
pushing markets higher and higher and higher until we got to 1966. Now you have a period of, of beginning a period of civil unrest, um, the war in Vietnam. Eventually you hit Watergate, uh, the oil embargo, which kicks off inflation. And now, whereas the massive wind was at your back in one way, now it's going the opposite way. And I think the Dow just about kissed a thousand in 1966. Didn't get over it on a permanent basis until 1982. 16 years on a nominal basis of sideways action in the Dow. On, on a, if, if you adjust that for um, inflation, it, it, it was worse than 29, uh, the 29 crash. So just really a, a shocking era. Those are examples of a secular bull market, and that secular bull had cyclical bear pullbacks within it. And conversely, 66 to 82, uh, 82 a 16-year bear market with cyclical counter-trend rallies uh, that spasm upwards. And, and then that continued, 82 to 2,000, giant expansion of multiples, um, just about 1,000% on the Dow. I don't usually look at the Dow. I'm, I'm more of a, a S&P 500, NASDAQ 100, Russell 2000 sort of guy. But that was sort of the benchmark those days. And there really wasn't an S&P 500 trading uh, for, for the first half of that era um, very actively. I think Vanguard rolled that out late 70s, and, and it had almost no assets for, for a long time. But 82 to 2000, huge run up, lots of occasional counter trend rallies, uh, market peaks March 2000. You're really not above those highs across the board until March 2013. So the question, when, and when you look at the world from a secular, hey, is this a 10, 15-year bull move, what, what did the pandemic do? Did the down 34% affect a reset? What does the $5 trillion in fiscal stimulus do? How much of a win is that at your back? You know, uh, it's funny. I, I don't really think of myself as a bull or a bear. Um, there weren't a lot of people more negative on the markets in the mid-2000s because my mom was a real estate agent. I always tracked real estate. And if you were looking, if you were squinting in the right way and looking at real estate, it was pretty clear that something wicked this way was coming. And so uh, back then I had a reputation of being a perma bear. For the past 13 years, I have a reputation of being a perma bull. I, I just want to stay on the right side of the dominant trend. And I think that dominant trend is driven by these huge secular movements in society, in the economy, in, in the, um, I don't want to say politics, but in the zeitgeist, you know, when, when everybody is all upset. And, and that's kind of one of the things that makes the whole woke argument so interesting. How close is this to um, the women's revolution, the, 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 the fight for rights uh, amongst African-Americans? That um, giant civil rights uprising uh, suddenly changed the 20 year post war course of events that became a headwind. It's not any one thing, it's the totality of all these circumstances. Hey, are we in a period of broad economic expansion and all these good things are happening, or are we in a period of contraction and we're facing a lot of headwinds? Um, P.S. I, I plead guilty to hindsight bias and narrative fallacy here because, hey, we know how it worked out. And so, I'm telling a little bit of a story. Uh, to be fair, I've been telling the same story since 2013 that this feels like a secular bull market that has, you know, typically a decade, decade and a half to go. The variable is I just don't know what the 2020 reset did and, and how much further this has to go. All right. That's terrific. And um, look, we're going to keep going even when you leave. But I don't know how you shut on time. You, you're I mean, you've been more than generous with your time. I hope you're enjoying this. And we have. I feel guilty for not being able to log on and all i had to do was reboot no me. no it's all right well let's <laughs> you feel free to step out whenever you wish we got a few other smart cookies up here i want to go to urs and then munt urs please unmute yourself the floor is yours urs yeah thank you very much george uh barry thank you so much for being on the call you i don't know whether you remember we met with mark lehman and i interviewed you twice on my call when i still was working yes at ubs yeah. with art yes Cash, and i do remember that wow yes, that was yes, uh great to hear you. god that's like seven nine years ago that was a while yeah it's been a while that's for sure so i just wonder do you think the low in the market is in with the low that we made on october 13 
That's the first question. And the second question is, is there a time period that you think that we can compare what the market is doing right now? Like I remember 1994, the market kind of like went sideways and didn't really do a hell of a lot of anything. And the Fed was just passing. And then, you know, the market took off in 95 in a big way. But there have been other periods. You just mentioned 1946 when uh, the market really came down and went sideways until 1949 and didn't do a hell of a lot of anything before it took off and that low came in on the 14th of June 1949 if I'm not mistaken but there were other periods like 78 where the market just went sideways and went just kind of like nowhere for a while before it took off again so the question then is if this if, if your bullish case is intact how does this bullish case that you have, how does it play out in terms of uh, of the market? You know, is, is it uh, going to be similar like 1988, for instance, after the crash? How do you think it's playing out? It, Thank it's you so, so much. It, you know, it's so hard to find a parallel to what we've lived through for the past couple of years. You know, it, it, I, I want to say unprecedented, but every time I say that, Ray Dalio his voice rings in my head and, and he is fond of saying unprecedented is really means it just hasn't occurred in your lifetime. You know, you go back to 1919 and the 1918 and, and the last um, massive uh, pandemic virus that that, you know, killed lots of people and, and shut the economy down. Uh, it's kind of hard to compare that era of investing to this era, um, although there are certainly some parallels. And then, it, again, it's fairly unprecedented. You have to go back to the post-war era uh, in Europe to find fiscal stimulus um, that, that, you know, pretty much is 25, 30 percent of, of maybe more uh, of annual GDP over a couple of years, we, we just don't have a frame of reference that, that you can say something like that. Or, or rates going from zero to almost 5% in eight months, almost nine months. Again, pretty unprecedented. There, there are some areas where you've seen some spasms upwards and, and Volcker uh, comes to mind. But, you know, the Volcker era was of, of stagflation and this is clearly i kind of laughed when that word got trotted out last year the the problem is not that growth is too weak the problem is that you have all these consumers with jingle in their pocket companies with really good balance sheets everybody took advantage of low rates to refinance and so uh, the the economy more or less Looks, looks pretty robust, despite the Fed doing its best to slam on the brakes. Um, so it's really challenging to find a parallel where the overall economy, the market and the society and, and the fiscal and monetary policies overlap. It, 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 you know, I have yet to see anybody show me something that's where, where everything lines up, you, you can pull a little bit of some parallels elsewhere. Well, this is sort of like 98, and this is a little bit like 81, and this is a little bit. But, but they're very, very imperfect because the fundamental backdrop is just so different. So, so that's the challenge is, is if you want to use historical parallels, you can. Um, but but even in my, you know, secular bull and bear theses, you know, I never turn around and say, OK, the average um, here's the average bull market. And that means we have, you know, two years, four months and 17 days left because it's it's always different. It's always going to reflect whatever is happening at the moment. Uh, it, it, it to me, it's the past is it, it's useful as a guide, but but you certainly can't. You know, you got to look out the front windshield, not the rearview mirror. That's terrific, Barry. Great question, Urs. Uh, let's go to Munt and then Nostic with a quick follow-up. Munt, please unmute yourself. Hi, guys. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, well, the uh, the boomers kind of bash themselves a lot here. I'm a few months away from 40. I, I just wanted to get your guys' opinion on, I don't want to make this po political, but in terms of the 
in, in your guys' lifetimes, in terms of the amount of investment we've been getting into the United States, have you ever seen anything like this? Because I have to say, I'm kind of surprised in a good way, um, seeing how well everybody pulled together in Washington. That means Congress, Senate, everybody um, getting what needed to be done so far in terms of even uh, Foxconn coming over here and things like that. So in terms of investment from the outside, how good do you guys feel about, uh, or Barry, how good do you feel about what you've been seeing um, in terms of investment from outside into the U.S.? And yeah, manufacturing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, do you mean foreign capital flows into the U.S.? Is that, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and manufacturing, actually. In my lifetime, I never thought I'd we'd even get back to manufacturing in any way, shape, or form. So at least the way we are in the past few months. So that, that's what I want your opinion on. So, so there's this wonderful book, I can't pronounce the author's name, but it's called Americana, 400 Years of, of Capitalism. And essentially it talks about this giant partnership that has existed between the private and public sectors, between government and industry. And na name the industry, and in its early days it was too speculative and the returns would have taken too long for the private sector to invest. And, and they go back to railroads and uh, telegrams and like wherever you want to talk, computers, internet, uh, just you name the industry, there was some form of a private-public partnership um, that basically uh, did the fundamental R&D to allow the private sector to build on it. And it was a huge and, and tremendous investment. Um, following uh, the pandemic, I wrote something up for Business Week about, hey, we need another moonshot. We need another private-public partnership to try and um, give the economy the next great thing to work on. Uh, look, look at all the new drugs and the new um, therapies that have come from uh, genetics. Uh, the whole decoding of, of DNA, you know, the – National Institute of Health or whatever its predecessor name was, there, there was huge public funds there. It's hard to look around. SpaceX is a perfect example. That That's nothing without NASA going to the moon 50, 60 years ago. So, so I'm kind of like you. I'm pleasantly surprised um, that Biden turned out to be a much more consequential president than I think any of us expected. You know, I think it's pretty easy to see this, the gaffes and just kind of think of him as, you know, way past his sell-by date. But uh, the the Inflation Reduction Act, the some of the changes that are in that, some of the challenges to from China, um, and especially in light of the post-pandemic um, fragility of supply chains and just-in-time inventory, uh, you, you got to be pleasantly surprised at that. And, and I think that is a... Uh, a little bit of a tailwind that but both I mean, there is enormous uh, government incentives for green vehicles. They, they re-expanded all the EV stuff that wasn't available. Um, uh, you know, they all had run its course. Tesla had actually exhausted um, the federal credits that they had. And now that that whole run has been re-upped. And, uh, you know, I, I think we're going to look back in history and say, there were some substantial changes under this administration that uh, people really didn't expect to see happen. As far as foreign investment goes, um, uh, you know, the United States is still the cleanest shirt in a dirty hamper. You know, whenever people talk about the demise of the dollar, I, I kind of laugh. Where are you going to go? The euro, uh, the yen, the, the Chinese yuan. There's no place else to go. The dollar is the only game in town. Um, and has been for a while, as, as long as we don't blow it, which certainly is a realistic possibility. Uh, Europe has too much infighting. Uh, China, nobody trusts. I mean, would you? Do, who is going to let China become the reserve currency? People are genuinely afraid of of what would happen under that. And and you know, Japan has is still still hasn't recovered from the eighty nine peak in in. Um, the Nikkei, and, and that's before we get to their demographic issues. So uh, i pleasantly surprised. King Dollar has finally come off its highs. But, hey, if, if you haven't traveled out of the United States, if you're paid in dollars, you should go abroad because we haven't seen the dollar this strong in two decades. 
Thanks. Thanks for that great question. All right. So we're, I want to kind of, Barry's been really generous with this time. I want to, uh, we're going to do Oil God and then Gnostic with a follow up and Michael with a follow up. Oil God, please unmute yourself. Good to see you. What's up, my friend? Thank you, George and Barry. Great to hear from you. A question is for the next sort of three to five years. I mean, inflation is literally, uh, you know, pushing the tide out and you're all seeing now who's over leveraged and you mentioned that you know you, you you've obviously got family in real estate real estate here in canada seems to be the big shoe yet to drop and so when, when you when you're talking about unprecedented times i'd like to kind of ask your opinion on what do you do uh if we all knew going into covid that there were literally a subset of the population that couldn't live two weeks without a paycheck because it was so over levered. And then you look at some of these tech names uh, that rely on consumer spending, whether it's an Apple or a Tesla. And I'd just like to get your idea as to what we could be thinking of in terms of investments uh, going into the next few years. Because even if inflation was to dissipate from a sort of an input and all these numbers actually improving, I don't think individually, you know, the story is going to become any better for the consumer that these tech companies rely on. Over to you. So, so really, which which consumers and which tech companies? Um, Professor Galloway over at NYU used to show this wonderful chart of like a 500 or 300 mile ring around New York City and in the heart of Manhattan and the expensive areas. All the little dots represented cell phones. They were all apples. And then, and then you would go out a little further, and it's you know the ring around that was Queens and and Staten Island and Brooklyn, and those and those were a different color, and they represented uh, lower uh, economic strata areas, and and those um, those were androids. And then in dead center in the bullseye was like this little red dot, and it was the last five people still using Blackberries. And, and so um, in, in the heart of corporate New York. And, and, and so uh, there's a reason Apple is the wealthiest com- company in the world. They're not marketing, essentially, to the bottom half of, of the economic strata. They're, they're uh, marketing to the top half. Hey, every now and then an older phone will work its way down the price scale. And suddenly I'm, I'm talking to you on an uh, – a new iPhone Max Pro 14, iPhone 14, um, I, I think it's like $1,000. The cheapest phone is probably two years old, and it's like $300. You can get plenty of, quote-unquote, smartphones for well under $300. Some of them are free. And, and so different companies are going to fill different niches in, um, in the marketplace. You know, you could buy a Rolex, you could buy a Citizen, you could buy a Seiko. I, I would tell you the, the Seiko is going to keep better time than Rolex at, at, you know, a fraction of the price. So wherever there is a market niche, for the most part, someone will find a way to monetize it. The, the weird caveat the, that I've noticed over the past decade is that the middle has kind of disappeared. Like if, if you go out shopping for furniture or carpets, you could get like a bedroom set with everything for $2,000 or you could get a bedroom set for $22,000. But if you want a nicer than cheap bedroom set, there's just like this giant gap. And I, I, it's just a weird thing. I've noticed that um, more and more. And, and you look at the retailers, who, who's left in the middle? Macy's? So on, on the bottom, Sears and Kmart are all but gone. Uh, I guess uh, Walmart, Target, um, which I, I Target is sort of upper bottom. Um, it's weird how the spread of retail has, has kind of have reflected that. So some people have thought of that as a hollowing out. I, I don't really see it. I think, you know, hey, you know, you're in college or shortly thereafter, you go get Ikea um, and if you are uh, making a half decent living, you, you have some choices, but it's weird how, how this changes. It's become very dynamic and, and it's, there's not quite a niche for every price point, but you know, it, it creates opportunities for other companies to step in. Um, I, I don't, you know, even if we have a recession, maybe, you know, Apple slows down a little bit, um, 
But, you know, I, I replaced my phone kind of on a the, – the pandemic was the longest I went without replacing my phone, probably because my battery didn't crap out because I was in the house so much. So um, when, when I look at, at the consumer today, uh, there's a really interesting chart circulating that shows – how much money is left in consumer um, savings accounts, and it projects, you know, down from, you know, it was at a peak uh, in the middle of the CARES Act distribution, you know, a peak sometime in uh, uh, middle of 2021. Not coincidentally, inflation really started to take off around then, um, and and now people are project. I think it's three percent or four percent, but it's projected down to zero. Which means we probably have a couple more years before the consumer runs out of cash uh, un- unless the economy takes another leg up. And, and we'll see what happens with that. I don't know if I answered the question, digressing as I am, but um, I think that's the, the broader view. F- find that chart. I think Merrill Lynch did a version of it, and, and I think the Fed had a version of projected consumer savings rate. Out. Yeah, 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 Barry, that, that, that chart's been making the rounds. It's pretty widely available uh, on Twitter. Yeah. Um, by the way, before we go, to, before we go to a follow up from Nasik and Barron, just I mean, this has been an extraordinary space. Barry's been really generous with his time, uh, as is our custom. You know, we recently started passing the hat again for World Central Kitchen. Um, they really are doing God's work. This is a very high class problem we have in this room. Everyone's trying to figure out how to preserve, if not increase, their net worth. You're getting Barry's advice for you know, it's <laughs> Barry charges good money for his services and he's giving it to you for free. So. If you found value from this room or any other rooms you've done recently, I urge you to give generously to World Central Kitchen. I will put the link up in the nest. It's also on my feed. Uh, you know, we raised, I think, $220,000 earlier in the year. No one else on Twitter has done this. Uh, wow, that's a big number. Yeah, we started again a few weeks ago. We've had like another eight or 9000 I'd like to get to three hundred before the year is over. Um, so, you know, you guys are fabulous. It's an extraordinary community. And honestly, I mean, the caliber of speakers we have, like Barry, I mean, you really are getting something for nothing. So if you found value from this room or any of the other rooms, please, please, please give generously to World Central Kitchen. There are people out there who are hurting and need our help. I'll put the link up in the nest. I want to go to Gnostic for a follow-up and then uh, Michael. George, can, follow-up. can I just oh. ask Barry one thing on, on the savings thing? Yeah, um, uh, uh, hold on, hold on. Yes, yeah, so okay. we'll, we'll do Amy, Gnostic, and then Baron. Amy, you go first. Sorry, Nasek, I just wanted to, to get on this while we were still on Ladies always but, first. Uh, like you're sweet. Um, so, Barry, if it is the case that, that savings are so high, where is the increase in credit usage coming from? Because we're seeing, you know, this astronomical number of, of consumer credit debt and, and credit card usage and, and things like that. So is it that the savings distribution is is – different you know i don't like to say class but per class or or how do you think that that breaks down and where do you think that the the enormous usage of credit is is coming from economic strata is that is that what we're uh yeah i'm like what's the right word i don't like to use class right yeah right um so i'm looking on my computer for for the most recent chart of this and i'm not really finding anything that that is updated. Let me see what Fred has to say. Consumer loans, credit card, and other revolving credit. Uh, so, by the way, when you look at this, and I'll go five year, um, it collapsed during. Uh, it started rolling over before 2020. Oh no, that's 2020. It collapsed right into the from Q1 2020. Right down to Q2, that minus 34%. It got back up to break even in, in Q2 2021. And now it's plus 20% and tailing off. Um, so when you look at this on the, the max chart, it's way off the lows. It's went to a peak and kind of, you know, Q3 2022, it fell to 16%. I haven't seen the most recent data. Um, but you know, that's not a giant surprise when, when you see people, um, stops, you know, forced to use credit when they're all stuck at home until those 
checks came and then people started using more and more credit because it was so cheap. Now that the rates are higher and the cost of capital has gone up, I think the rollover is in part due to that people electing not to use credit. Um, it's high, it's above average, but it's not, you know, wildly excessive. What, what looks so excessive is, you know, that's a giant move from everybody relying on uh, minus 33 percent, everybody, you know, just doing nothing, stuck in place and living off of government checks to uh, the move off the lows here. Uh, I, I would I haven't taken these numbers apart recently. I would guess that some of this is um, some people are finding themselves in more, more distress Generally speaking, when we look at things like defaults and delinquencies, they're not terrible. Yeah, Barry, if I'm not mistaken, the uh, I forget what the terminology is, but the, uh, the the ability of consumers to service their debts, you look at income to debt to service ratios, admittedly, the debt service ratio is somewhat depressed by the low rates, but nevertheless, it's extremely healthy right now. It's right, the healthy. ability to service your debt. If right. you're just looking at, if you're just looking at the raw credit usage, it, it's elevated. But if you look at the uh, I- income to debt ratio, the ability to service that debt, yes. it's at record lows. So yeah, exactly. it's never been healthier than, than it is now. Yeah, exactly. Sorry. So I guess my, yeah, so I mean, but savings will be affected because now you're you're having to pay that debt off at higher interest rates. So I'm just wondering how that affects savings rates and and you know i'm sure there's going to be a lot of usage around christmas for christmas gifts and things like that so i'm, just, I'm curious about how these numbers kind of end well, up maybe like march of 23 yeah if you if you back out the seasonality um you know the assumption is the savings rates continue to tick down um but i you know i i don't make economic projections on on things like that i have no idea what consumer debt is going to look like um four months from now five months from now the, the, the assumption is, you know, people who are uh, not getting raises anymore because the economy is starting to slow um, are going to dip into savings a little bit or they're going to throttle back their consumption. So it's, you know, on one side slows the economy and the other side means people have more debt. It, it, it's pick your poison. Fair enough. All right. Thank so you. so th- thanks for that, Amy. All right, so we're gonna do three more, and then I'm gonna call it a day because we, we we're, we're kind of I gotta get some dinner. We're gonna do <laughs> Gnostic Gnostic for a quick follow up, then Baron for a follow up, and then Michael Gnostic forgers. One other thing, George, I wanted huh? to tell you that your profile picture it literally made me laugh out loud. Like I'm not just like LOLing you. I didn't <laughs> see it at first, and then I clicked into it, and I I, I cackled. So I just wanted to say that. What Amy's referring to is it's FTX monopoly that you can readily see, but every space says go directly to jail. Directly. Go go straight to jail. I go straight I didn't to see jail. It at first. I had to click exactly. into it. Yeah, anyway. it's funny. All right, so we do Gnostic Baron and Michael Gnostic. Yeah, well, Amy, just so you know that that mine is a direct poke at George because he was giving me a, a problem for not having a picture up, so I picked one that could probably irritate him more if he actually figured out where it came from but then he never commented which was quite upsetting um anyway barry uh so many things to say so many comments uh so much interaction and i actually feel like i'm back in new york sitting at the junior desk about to get my ear cuffed for making a bunch of mistakes so you're making me feel right at home um which is i find absolutely hilarious um makes me want to go back to new york and, and start trading again uh, anyway, the, the, when you're sitting down talking about public-private uh, interactions, those go back hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years uh, in economic history uh, to sit down and, and raise entire areas up. Venice was, Venice was developed that way in multiple ways and then brought in banking. Uh, Genoa was developed that way, Basque region, uh, Catalonia, France, Britain, Germany. All of those economies were built on a public-private uh, enterprise to sit down and bring things in either through regulation or through investment uh, and did did amazing. And I think you're completely right about putting something in to sit down and expand the economies on an ongoing basis. Um, it, it's, you know, if we could do that, it would be great. But that kind of brings me to my question, which sort of goes back to what Oil God was talking about. Um, in the markets today, what you're talking about when you're sitting down and saying, is it a, a bull market, a bear market? 
basically summarized as momentum up or down uh, across the whole spectrum. Do you think that, that the whole investment strategies at the moment could be divided in a different way to a momentum play either up or down, long or short, or a picker's market where you actually need somebody to sit down and look at the individual companies to figure out how they're going to do irrelevant of the momentum that's going on in the marketplace? Huh. So, so let me, I'm, I'm going to kind of half answer your question. So, so I'm never a fan of, of the phrase momentum because I'm not really sure what it means and how to quantify it. However, trend is something that I can wrap my head around. So you always want to be on the right side of the trend. And then, then the next question becomes, which trends, the long-term trend, the short-term counter trends, you know, really it, it, it's why so often people are arguing with each other when they're in agreement, they just have different time horizons. So, so, so much for, for momentum um, on the stock picking side, you know, I, I, I kind of part of the reason I gravitated towards broad indexing is I, I love a great story. I, I believe, you know, any CEO with really a compelling tale, I, I'm just there. When I was younger, I was just nodding my head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That sounds great. And and I, you know, very easily could just have had a portfolio full of, you know, well-told garbage. And and so what I found is the the core of the portfolio is a broad index if if you want to dabble around the ends around the outside with certain things hey i like small cap value or you know i like the india etf which has you know perennially disappointed even though there's now an indonesian etf there there are a lot of different ways you can express an investment thesis in a very simple um holding um, but the other thing I've kind of learned to appreciate through direct indexing is basically um, uh, striking things out that you don't want. So, you know, uh, if if you had come to me two years ago and said, I want the S&P 500 minus the crap, what would you take out? Well, we mentioned Tesla and Facebook. I, I've been critics of both for a while. Um, I don't have a problem with, with Google, Apple, Microsoft. Uh, we, we all knew that the work at home stocks were going to crash. We just didn't know when, right? If you go back and look at some of those charts, the, the, um, the Teladocs and the Pelotons and the Netflix, uh, there isn't a person in America that didn't know those stocks were going to, you know, get taken out to the woodshed. Good luck getting Hold that. Hold on, wait, 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 break in, break in, break in. The, the person whose last name is Wood, I don't think she was aware that we're going to go to the woodshed. No pun intended, Barry. Um, I, You know, again, Nodig, Dave Nodig and I have been talking about how do we get a short off in that? Um, and, and just, uh, you know, it, it ne never did anything. A every trade, Everybody who's a trader at heart has this running list of missed opportunities that you right. kind of kibitz about yeah. and then right. don't execute. Right. And ARC was one of them. So Barry, I'm going to hijack this here. We're going to make a right turn. This is an important subject. We're talking before about narratives and the democratization of finance. And some of these fellows out there, guys and gals, who take liberty with the truth. I have no problem with losing money. I mean, well, I, I do. I don't like to lose money, but you know, losing money, it's part of the business, okay? Right. There's some God, trading God's given, and they take it away. But I do have a problem. Every cycle has a carnival barker. The one who pushes just a little bit too hard, perhaps takes liberty with uh, the truth. You know, Alber Alberto Vilar, you know, wound up in jail, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Or it's just downright irresponsible. Now, I'm actually going to name names here. She needs to be called out, all right? I mean, Barry, you run an, you run an RIA, Okay. Never in a million years would you countenance the idea of promising or representing returns to prospective investors. To have the cojones to go out there and say, oh, I'm going to go up 50 or 60 percent in five years. I mean, what type of, okay, here comes the Yiddish, what type of Mishagas is this? I mean, come on, dude. Like, how, like, how does she get away with this? Why does the mainstream media not call her out? I mean, you, you, you work at a firm where compliance would be up your backside so fast. If you even thought of saying such a thing, how does she get away with this crap? And why aren't the authorities holding her accountable? 
All right. So, so two things. First, there is a reverse ARC ETF out there. We are very want... aware of that in this room. But by the way, my favorite tw- Twitter follower, since you said it's a name that cannot be mentioned, it's the reverse. The inverse that... framer. We, uh, uh, oh. Barry, Barry, you got to hang out in these rooms. It's my favorite follow. He, 100%. He... 100%, 100%. It, it works for sports also. He did the other day with the Philadelphia Eagles. I fell off my chair. So here's the thing about. It happened with the World Series, too. He, the, uh, it, the day that the Astros won the World Series, Kramer posted a picture of him in a Phillies jersey in the office saying, go Phillies, and the Astros won the World Series. I mean, um, I, have a, I have a handful of, of fake Twitter accounts uh, impersonating me. I, I don't begrudge Jim any of the Michigas that, that he has, um, has fallen his way. I mean, you could say he, he's encouraged some of it. But, but let's talk about Kathy Woods. And I, I'm going to give you a little nuance here. Um, my buddy Ben Carlson, uh, who is the head of institutional in my office and, and on my investment committee, and, and P.S., shout out to Ben, he was the driver of we really need to tighten up our duration, shorten up our duration on our fixed income um, in the beginning of this year. Huge, huge. We're, we're uh, huge, huge impact on the performance of, of for clients. It, it, it was – um, uh, my only credit is recognizing how smart he is and, and saying that makes perfect sense. Let's do that. But he talks about type one and type two charlatans. And my favorite example from history is, you know, some people call, um, uh, Grubman, a, a type one charlatan. Uh, and, um, I'm drawing a blank on her name. She was Morgan Stanley's strategist who went to, some big venture firm, maybe a uh, Andreessen Horowitz. Mary Meeker is a type two charlatan, and here's the difference: type one charlatans say whatever they have to say to get the sale, the commission. They don't care what happens. Type two charlatans believe their own bullshit. They think um, what they're saying is true. They just happen to be wrong. And the reason I can tell you, Kathy Woods is a type two and not a type one is when her firm was just about at its peak, and I want to say about $68 billion, she had a relationship with the distributor of the firm, of, of the funds, the, the essentially the sales group, that gave them the right to buy her out. And she bought them out for some undisclosed amount. So essentially, with borrowed money, she top-ticked herself Late in, I don't. I want to say it was twenty twenty or twenty late in twenty twenty one. I was on trillions with Joel Weber and Eric Balchunas, and we were talking about this. And we, li- I literally said, "Hey, it would be hilarious if it turns out she top ticked herself." And lo and behold, um, she bought out her partner, who, who by the way, funded her when the fund had like you know millions of dollars, not billions of dollars, and she put into it. So I, I don't I don't really pay a whole lot of attention to her. She she demolished everybody. Um, was it twenty twenty? She was plus one hundred and sixty eight percent. Some crazy number. No one was even second. And and she bought in at the top. Uh, and lo and behold, since then uh, everything has rolled over on her. You know she's a big shareholder of Tesla. She's a big shareholder of Bitcoin. Those stories sound great, and and then the narratives collapse. And what you're left over with the narrative when once the narratives collapse is simply a bad trade, a bad investment, and a bad analysis. Yeah, and, but, but, but I have to interrupt you because like the analysis is complete garbage. I've gone through it. Others have gone through it. Yeah, you, you know. And, and, but, but but I want to get to the. I actually want to talk to the illegality of what she's doing. You, she is, she's out and out violent. You're an RIA. She has broken the law with some of her representations, and yet she's not held to account. Like, I mean, could you imagine? I mean, could you could you imagine never in a million years saying the kind of stuff she says? I mean, like, what that? What gives, Barry? How does she get away with this stuff? So I mean, I'm at an ETF event in Iceland in I don't know 2018, 2017, something like that. I can look it up. And a friend uh, from the ETF group introduces me. Hey, you're always looking for new people for masters in business. Uh, you should talk to Kathy Woods. She's got a fund that's doing well. She's interesting. 
And I have a whole conversation with her at the bar. And I decide to pass on that interview. Now, I eventually interviewed her for for um, uh, for someone else at, a, at an online forum when we were all locked up at home. Um, but I never brought our master's in business because there was something that I couldn't put my finger on. It just kind of made you know, I'm not sure if this is a good fit. Um, and I'm not sure I buy her approach, but there was never anything I could say, Hey, this is what the fraud is. It, it, it just didn't, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't get comfortable with, um, uh, the, the, the theoretical approach that said, she, she did round trip which which is not uncommon, and and that suggests it was more luck than skill. You know, normally when you have this run up where you wildly outperform the market, and then this run down where you wildly underperform the market, that tends to be indicia of chance as opposed to skill. And so, you know, I, I don't I don't know how else to to describe it. If if she was really a, a good investor, she would have tapped out and at the top sold to her partner and let let him buy her out and sail off to the sunset. Um, but, but that's not always how humans operate. So Barry, uh, we're running short on time here there, but before we get to Baron and Michael, there's one thing I forgot to ask you about, and it's not so intended for you to be able to take a victory lap. It's more learning from the past and being able to use as a reference point for the future. And we go back to 2000 and, uh, eight, 2009, mm-hmm. Uh, you and Mark Haynes turned about turned bullish at about the same time. And, you know, people always probably ask you the question, you know, what would it take for you to turn bullish? What would it take for you to turn bearish? But using, yeah, you know, maybe just walk us through, like, what gave you the cojones to, like, turn positive, you know, pretty close to the low in 09? And, you know, <laughs> I wish we'd have another life, the opportunity of that in our lifetime. But maybe talk about the thought process that that that, that 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 made you turn bullish. What light bulbs went on off in your head, and then when you think about what your dashboard looks like now, what's red, what's green, you know, sources of risk, sources of opportunity. So I think to contextualize what your 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 opinions right now, it'd be useful as a frame of reference to maybe just just uh, tether off of no pun intended, sure. t- tether off two thousand nine. <laughs> Sure. So, so I had read a short paper by Reinhardt and Rogoff called um, Five uh, Financial Crises that, that had come out in like 2007. And from memory, it was Japan, U.S. 20 in 1929, Mexico, Sweden, and I, I can't remember what the fifth one was. Um, and they looked at financial crises and said, hey, on average, markets get cut in half. Hey, on average, real estate falls 30 percent. And on average, you lose this much GDP and this much unemployment and blah, blah, blah. It was just the average. It was no really nothing really sophisticated. So I said, hey, this is a fascinating idea. Uh, what happens if real estate drops 30 percent? Let's reverse engineer the, the Dow and come up with a number. And so the number I ended up with was 6,800. How did I get 6,800? Uh, reverse engineering the earnings, I came up with 9,800. But said, hey, from 13,000, we break 10 at 9,800. It causes a 3,000 point panic. I, by the way, I initially said 4,000 points. A friend said 2,000. Split the difference, 3,000. And, and uh, you know, so we were 100% cash in uh, January 08. And we had famously some shorts on and CIT and AIG and Lehman. Um, Charlie Gasparino, God bless him, goes on CNBC and says, who are you going to listen to, Barry Ritholtz or David Einhorn on Lehman or Dick Fault? It's like, thank you so much, Charlie. I really, really appreciate that. Uh, just just even naming me in the same sentence with with David Einhorn, I, I consider it an honor. So um, so we break 10,000, and I tag a, a buddy who's a technician, and I say, listen, I don't know if we're going to get down to this Dow 6800 thing that I caused a brouhaha with you know, a, a, a year or two ago, but there's an outside shot. Whatever happens, don't let me become that asshole that doubles down at 6,800 and says 3,400. And you know exactly the sort of people I'm talking about. So, so at 6,800, just kick my ass. If I, if I don't seriously talk about 
hey, because because at that point the market's cut in half. Show me another instance where buying a U.S. equities down fifty percent isn't a, a, a generate a strong return at least a couple of years out, if not sooner than later. Uh, and so, by dumb coincidence, in end of February when the Dow blows through sixty eight hundred and we blow through fifty percent, I'm on vacation. I, I'm on sitting on. Uh, I want to say Grand Cayman, but I'm not positive. I'm in I'm in some islands. And by the time I get back, we're down to like 6,400, I think. I don't know how much lower we went than that. And so I, I opened up my dashboard and literally every sentiment indicator, every metric you could look at, there wasn't a one that wasn't pinned. If you remember the old stereos with the VU meters and the red, they're all pinned all the way to the right. And, and so... Um, I'm back from vacation. I had done the Dow 6800 video with Henry Blodgett uh, at, at 12,000. We broke 10,000. I went on the on Yahoo Finance with him. And I reached out and said, hey, I'm writing up a piece saying cover your shorts and go long here. We're, we're looking at the mother of all bear market rallies. I didn't know if it would last, but I certainly was looking for a big snapback. And so we go on Yahoo Finance and – Hey, you could cover your shorts and buy them here. Market shot right through my 6,800 downside target. Uh, you could have asked me the same question a month earlier, a month later. I would have given you the same answer. It just was dumb luck that it was the day before, you know, March, I think, 6th or 7th. The next day, the March bottomed. It's up 1,000 points, and, and we never looked back. The fascinating takeaway from that was that there were a bunch of studies done not just on 0809, but previous major crashes. And it turns out that about 30% of people who panic out at the lows never get back into equities again. And so for everybody who was asked, hey, what, when do I step aside? How do I get out of the way if this is all going to go to hell? You know, one in three, you are going to tap out and never own stocks again. And that's the biggest risk to me when you when you look out at um at how much of a dislocation we we can have ps people start throwing money at us and and rather than just set up a two and 20 fund where i could have extracted a ton of immediate value but you're only as good as your last trade i said let's let's convert this into a longer term me and, and my partner said let's convert this into a longer term um, investment by participating in the long run, as opposed to just trying to squeeze as much juice as you can this moment. And, and that ultimately led to the launch of, uh, Root Health's wealth management almost a decade uh, ago. So, Barry, let me ask one thing. Hey, George. Yeah, they, just, they just arrested that. Yeah, I know. In the Bahamas. I just posted the, the letter wow, that's amazing. General yeah, on I, my I, Twitter. I, yeah. I, I posted as well. And is, is Amy, you'd love this. Oh, Someone you posted said- it? No, yeah, so I put it up on the desk. Someone, someone, someone sent me a tweet, a back tweet. They say, "Well, he landed that I go to jail." <laughs> so I anyway, I just posted the official. Um, yeah, no, he, he general up in the desk. Yeah. If anybody so, wants to see it, yeah. So th- th- there is a god. There is a god. So, so Barry, follow up question. Um, when you reflect on you know things clients say and what they don't say. You know, they're either hiding in their basement because the world's coming to an end or they're static and they're throwing money at Kathy Wood or whatever. Uh, it is, I always talk about wrong way, Louie. I'm sure you probably have some clients. They're the Federal Witness Protection Program, so they'll remain nameless. But you probably, but you have some wrong way, Louis, and you have the smart money. What, what do you, what, forget about your own opinion. Take yourself, take yourself out of your own views. But when you survey the client base, and some are known for being great country indicators, some guys are, you know, got a good nose to be around the basket at the right time. What do you observe from the clients, Barry? So, so you know, a lot of this, we, we're I'm the wrong person to ask that for two reasons. The first is our clients all come to us. We don't have salespeople. All, all of our clients are inbound. They're, they're self-selecting. They say, hey, uh, what do I have to do to set up an account with you guys? And we don't just, you know, very Bernie Madoff-like, we don't just take money from anybody. We... I say that uh, as a joke, and, and I know everybody's rolling their eyes now. But we, we kind of go through a process where are we a good fit for you? Are you a good fit for us? Here's how we approach the world. Here's what you should 
understand we're, we're not going to do X or Y or Z. We're going to really keep it simple and plain vanilla. It, it's just the least exciting way to invest, but probably one of the better ways to invest. Uh, so, so I don't really find myself drawn in to a lot of the clients, um, that virus of their emotional um, world. Every now and then something gets back to me. True story. Um, a couple of Fridays ago, I want to say it was early October, you know, we have a company Slack and I share with the whole office, hey, not for nothing, but everything looks pretty, pretty ugly here. Um, but but if you have any cash lying around and, and you want to put to work, here, here's where you should put it to work. Uh, the, the market is, is as, again, it's as negative as we've seen it this year. We had a bounce off the June lows and and then made a new set of lows in October. And so feel feel free. You know, I can't tell you where the market will be next week or next month, but a couple of years from now, it should be appreciably higher. That's my long term perspective. I hear back from uh, one of our advisors that a client uh, on uh, he shared this with the client, which he wasn't supposed to. This was an internal discussion because that's we don't offer market timing services. It was just me and my instinct and uh, he the the guy says to the advisor yeah your boss is an idiot he doesn't know what he's talking about let's have a conversation monday i got to move my money to someone who's less of a moron uh, okay so that monday was the day <laughs> by dumb luck the market is up 5% the next day it's up another 3% and the client says yeah, anytime I say anything about your boss, remind me that I'm the idiot. I don't know what I'm doing. I wasn't forecasting a market bounce Monday. This was just, uh, you know, uh, the line I had said was the risks here feel asymmetrical. It feels like the market is wound tight. Yeah, can we see the Fed over tighten? Can earnings collapse? Can the market grind lower? Sure, but it, it looks like so much bad news is already baked into the market. It wouldn't take a whole lot of anything for the markets to explode to the upside. And so sometimes, you know, uh, you know, clients will hear what they want to hear. I, we, we normally, when I do a quarterly call, it's very 10,000 foot view. It's never that sort of stuff. It's always, here's what we, how we see things progressing. Here's what you're, uh, you know, there's so much misinformation in the media about, uh, about non-farm payrolls, about inflation, about this. We just want clients to be knowledgeable and informed and know that we're informed so they can not worry about their their portfolios and so um i I, i'm mostly insulated from the real craziness um from from clients but it filters back to me and i you know other than my brother-in-law nobody is a a perfect contrary indicator for the most (laughs) part for the most part you know some uh, every now and then i'll have a client we have a client who runs a very big jewelry chain we have another client who's got a whole bunch of, of car dealerships. And every now and then I'm like, hey, so what are you seeing in Southern California? Hey, what are you seeing in, in New York and Los Angeles and, and D.C. and Boston in terms of high end? Uh, and, and I'll get a little bit of color from that. But, you know, those are anecdotes. You really can't rely on that. To that, 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 that that's, that's terrific. Man. All right. We're going to do two more and then we're going to call it a day. Um, we're going to do uh, Baron, and then Michael's going to have the last word. Baron, please unmute yourself. Uh, I have no follow up except for thank you very first time. Appreciate it. That's great. And by the way, I want to follow Barry on Twitter. And you know, he's, he's, I have no commercial relationship with Barry, but like what you're hearing, um, you know, I'm sure he wouldn't mind getting some new customers as well. So he's he's a registered investment advisor. All right, we're going to go to Michael for the last for, for the last uh, last question. Michael, please unmute yourself. Guys, thanks. I, I, I just want to say one thing that uh, it's a pleasure listening to you guys and listening to Barry. Um, if I look at Apple in two, if I look at uh, Microsoft in 2000 and I look at Apple right now, there's a lot of similarities in that it was a cash flow machine that could never, ever go down. And my question is this. Um, we're seeing a seismic shift. It's kind of similar, but different than Microsoft in that in Microsoft's time, it was an antitrust issue and, and 
in, in this instance, it's more of um, the fact that they're going to leave China and go somewhere else. Um, and my question is this. Can Apple ever go down again, Barry? So, so Apple, of course, Apple can go down. There isn't a company in the world that can't not go down. The, the question is always one of timing. When, when we look at, at, I love these old charts of um, the stocks that were in the Dow, the stocks that are in the S&P 500, um, these long uh, longitudinal charts. You, you see, or, or look at what are the 10 biggest companies, the 20 biggest companies, they change over time constantly because somebody invents a widget or they have some um, advantage and then they have a flywheel that allows them to sustain that advantage for a while, for a decade, for two decades. And then eventually somebody creates a better mousetrap and they fall out of favor. You know, GM and Ford were dominant for how long? And then eventually they fell out of bed. Tesla's kicking ass the past you know, five years, and, and they appear to be falling out of bed. There's always somebody that's going to come along and, and eat your lunch. I, I have a vivid recollection of, will Cisco be the first trillion-dollar company? When was the last time anyone mentioned Cisco? Do we want to talk about Intel? What the hell happened there? They were dominant. Um, the kiss of death, they got put into the Dow. Uh, although I guess that's not true because Apple and Microsoft were there. So, so there's always some giant... Sears, uh, Bell Labs, AT and T, so some dominant company that eventually gets eclipsed. It's just a matter of time. Humans are terrible at understanding time. We 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 live in the here and now, and we have a very hard time conceptualizing decades. But yeah, eventually Apple will be a stub, and people will look at Apple and say. They were the greatest company, the biggest company in the world. So when was that? But, you know, I can't tell you if that's two weeks or two centuries from now. It's probably somewhere in between. Thank you, guys. Barry, this has really been a sword, of course. And uh, thank you so much for being so generous with your time, over two hours. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as we have. I hope you've learned something from all the smart cookies in the audience. I hope you'll consider coming back. And again, uh, if you found for for everyone in the room, um, if you found you know in honor of Barry, please give generously to World Central Kitchen. Um, I know he would very much appreciate it, and there are a lot of people out there who are really hurting and could could, could use our support. And so Barry, I salute you. I thank you. Uh, I hope you'll come back again, even if not as a speaker. Maybe just come out and hang out in these rooms. Sometimes we do these rooms twice a week. Um, you know, be, you could just drop in from time to time and. And, and put in your two cents. You can say things here you can't say on, on, on national TV. So, Barry, I want to thank you tremendously. This has been My awesome. pleasure, George. Thanks so much for having me. This has been fantastic. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Barry. Good night. Uh, and by the way, last thing for everyone, I'm going to be gone for for uh, 10 days or so. So uh, you won't you won't get bored with any spaces from me uh, for the next 10 days. So um, we've done five and seven days. So you've, you've heard enough of me for now. So in any event, what, everyone did take you get to take a vacation. Oh yeah, well you know what you know what I may drop in some, I may drop in some rooms from Aruba, but uh, we'll we'll see we'll see. You the Bahamas? Aruba, 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 Aruba. Okay. Aruba. All right, everyone, take care. Take care. Good night, everyone. Bye, Be George. well. Take care. Good night. Good night.